Oh yeah, it's mind pump time. Hey, check it out. We're going to give away MAPS HIT today. So it's a great workout program. It's HIT training done right. It's using weights. Here's how you can win that program. Leave a comment in the first 24 hours. Talk about this episode. In this episode, we talk about the 15 reasons why you might not be feeling good. And these are surprising reasons. List some other ones that we might not have come up with. So give us some other ones and reasons why people might not be feeling good that they maybe didn't consider. And if we pick your comment, if we think you have one of the best comments or one of the best surprising reasons, we'll give you free access to Maps Hit. Isn't that awesome? Also, subscribe to this channel. Turn on your notifications. You got to do those two things. And one more thing, we're running a sale right now. Maps Prime, Maps Prime Pro, and the Prime Bundle, all 50% off. Go check them out. Head over to mapsfitnessproducts.com. Just use the code June Prime with no space for the discount. All right, enjoy the podcast. So I wanted to do uh, a, a podcast on things that, uh, or reasons why people tend to not feel well that are not obvious, mm. you know, um, things that we identified in clients often where people are like, ah, I'm not, just not feeling good. And you do the usual, you know, checklist of things and everything looks okay. And then it ends up turning out to be something that's not, that's surprising, you know, that's not co conventional. So I want to talk about some of the things that we've noticed that have caused people or even ourselves to not feel so good that are just not typically not so obvious. And once we say them, I think they're obvious sometimes, but we don't often go to them. Oh, first. no, they sound obvious. Actually, what what I think kicked this conversation off, I really like this. It was fun to sit down and kind of all three of us rack our brains of, you know, trying to recall the clients that we had and like the aha moments and the very first one uh, that we'll talk about of the 15 is the one that I mentioned recently on the podcast that I actually heard Justin was giving this tip. So I had already been a, a manager. So I was leading trainers five years in or so. And I have Justin and, and I, he'd already been working with me for a while. And I overheard him talking to this client about because uh, she was complaining of like fatigue and, and not feeling well or what like that. And he was talking about water. Mm -hmm. And, you know, up until that point, uh, that wasn't on my list. It wasn't mm -hmm. on my top check asking them questions. And I thought, because you just think it is so basic and simple that, oh, everyone knows. Everybody's already drinking water. Yeah, everyone t knows that you're supposed to drink water. So I just didn't think to ask that. And when I saw him do that, and then I began to kind of apply that with my clients going forward, I found that uh, more often than not, that actually solved a lot of problems for clients. It's kind of funny because that was one of those things that seems super obvious, but <clears throat> unless you're intentionally constructing your day and, and making sure that you're seeking out water, a lot of times you fall behind and then that carries over into the day after that. And for me, it was really uh, you know, eye-opening because <clears throat> I had... Um, I'm going to for clamp, you guys. You need some um, water right yeah, now. Yeah, I see some water. <laughs> <laughs> I had headaches a lot, and this was something that I didn't ever attribute that to drinking water and being dehydrated. And also, I was experiencing fatigue and started to really be intentional about drinking water, and it made a massive difference. And then also, as I was conveying this over to my clients, finding out that this was a rare thing, like they more than not, they were eating or eating, they were drinking a very low volume of water, and it was also affecting things like joint pain and yes. all kinds of other things. That's a big one. I noticed with my clients with pain and inflammation, they would come to me and be like, oh, this is stiff, I feel tight. And we would do correctional exercise. We do all the all the tools that I had in my tool belt to help them, and it would help. But sometimes it would kind of linger. And I remember hearing this from another trainer that worked uh, with me in my studio was to drink more water. And so I said, you know, why don't you try drinking, you know, half a gallon of water a day or a gallon of water a day, depending on the size of the person. And they would do it, and they'd come back and be like, my joint pain's gone. Yeah. I, and I couldn't believe that water would do that. Now, for me, I pieced this together for something that is I didn't even consider, which was the pump. Oh. I I had no idea that the now obviously this it's is a huge part of the process. This is obvious now because you think about the pump and it's fluid in the muscle. But if I drink, if I don't drink enough water, because I work out first thing in the morning, if I don't wake up and have a couple glasses of water, my pump is severely reduced. If I wake up, have a couple glasses of water before I work out, makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. So now I, I like to tell people to, to try to aim for about a half a gallon to a gallon of water a day. It's just a nice rough estimate. 
Um, and it makes a huge difference. Suppresses people's appetite. That's another big one that I noticed. Yep. People would have less cravings as a result, yep. um, less headaches, less inflammation. And then the other one is more energy, which is strange because you don't think water gives you energy, but not having enough water saps you yeah. of energy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the next one, um, this one's uh, another big one. And this reminds me actually of, of DMs that I get uh, quite often from people. So I'll give you an example of a DM, right? Someone will send me a message and they'll say, you know, Sal, I've been following this this ketogenic diet and I've been doing it now for three months, um, uh, but I, I still suffer from constipation and I'm not feeling so good. Uh, how how long do I need to stick to it before I feel good? I was like, yeah. okay. This- yeah, or what should I do? <laughs> yeah, it's not working yeah, for you, Why isn't this right? working? Yeah, and this is, it's basically people following the wrong diet for their body. There's a pretty wide individual variance with how people feel eating particular ways. I've had clients who thrive on a diet that's much higher in carbohydrate, you know, lower in protein. And I've had clients who do much better on a higher protein, higher fat diet. I've had clients where eating plant-based made them feel the best. I've had clients on the other end of the spectrum where they eat mostly meat and they feel best. This one really has to do with listening to your body. And mm-hmm. sometimes we stick to a diet because we read about it and we see the studies and we see the articles and we say, this is what I'm supposed to do. But we ignore the fact that maybe that diet's just not working for our body. I actually think this is a, a more common than not. Uh, and it, a lot of times it's because everybody has that friend who followed the Atkins or followed the ketogenic diet or followed the zone diet or does intermittent fat. They, they do something and they go, oh my God, like and Susie. They just transform right yeah, in front of your eyes. Yeah, right. They transform, they look amazing and like you're sold. That's it. I didn't need to read no studies. I, didn't need some, I know my friend Susie, she did this and it changed her life. I've known Susie, she's been fat her whole life. Now she looks amazing. Yeah. So I'm sold. And then they do it and they stick to it just because it had success for Susie. And they come to me and they're just trying to figure out why is this not working for me? And they're trying to force it and you're trying to force a, you know, scround, a, a square peg in a round hole. It's yeah. like your body's trying to tell you it's not for you. And so I think this this happens more often than you you would you would think because people hear about something or see something work for somebody else, assume that it must be great for them too. Yeah. Now in, in our space, we see this often with people who eat a lot of protein because we're told a high protein diet is good for satiety. It's good for muscle building and recovery, which is true. But there's definitely cases where it doesn't affect it affects someone's digestion wrong, uh, or in a way that's negative, or it makes them feel sluggish. Mm-hmm. But yet they doggedly stick to it because that's what the articles say. The that's literature what it, says the literature yeah. says. I need to eat a lot of protein, and it's like no man. It's you might not be feeling good even though you're eating health, you know, quote unquote healthy foods, and you're following the diet to a T. It might not be the right diet for well, you. Well, another aspect to consider with this, something that Doug actually brought up, uh, was uh, food intolerances. And oh, so, yeah. you know, so that's something, too, that makes a massive impact on individual variances based off of if this diet that you're following and you, you have uh, foods included in there that may actually be causing you uh, inflammation or, uh, you know, you have some kind of reaction to it uh, without going through an elimination process and figuring that out. Uh, that could be a component there as well. I had a lady who suffered from uh, psoriasis and we were trying to isolate what could possibly be contributing to this. And it turned out to be bananas. Bananas were were triggering an autoimmune issue or response and she would get psoriasis. And her response to me was, but I eat bananas every morning. <laughs> I've been eating bananas for years. I'm like, well, how long have you had psoriasis for? You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not working for your body. So you got to pay attention to these things and listen uh, to your body. All right, this next one is a bit controversial, and I love talking about this because we've been pushed so hard in one direction, not realizing that in many cases, especially with athletes or especially with people that eat a whole food-based diet, people that work out a lot, oftentimes they don't feel good or don't have a lot of energy because they're not eating enough sodium. This is a big one. Now, if your diet's very high in heavily processed foods, you're probably fine. Heavily processed foods are super, super high in sodium. But whole natural foods, even if you salt them, even if you add salt to your steak and your baked potato and your rice and all your your whole natural foods, even if you add salt, oftentimes it's too low for someone who's active, for someone who has a lot of muscle or someone who sweats a lot. Adding sodium can dramatically improve your energy, improve your pump, improve your sense of uh, well-being. I think this is even more common in our uh, with our audience. 
because a lot of people that are listening to this podcast are obviously health conscious. They are working out. They're trying to better themselves. And many times they're coming from uh, the opposite side of not eating very well, not exercising, mm -hmm. not doing those things. Then all of a sudden you make this switch. I'm going to increase activity and exercise, and I'm also going to cut out all the fast food and garbage. So you take somebody who's used mm -hmm. to eating, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of milligrams of sodium to all of a sudden reducing that dramatically because just by simply cutting out fast food and switching over to better choices that are or whole foods, you cut your sodium like more than in half. Like it becomes like a tenth mm -hmm. of what your body was used to intaking. And then in addition to that, you introduce exercise, mm -hmm. which is also the body's going to want more sodium for that. So I actually think our audience benefits from things like this more more than the average person even. Yeah. When when we were first introduced to, this is just a, a, a product now that we work with. When we were introduced to Element, um, I thought I saw oh electrolyte powder, big deal. Like there's so many of them, it's not that big of a deal. Then you know, like it was like two months later, I took a closer look and I said, oh shit, they put a thousand milligrams per serving in this. They're actually doing it the right way because most electrolyte powders, remember, they're targeting athletes, they're targeting people who eat either low carb diet. By the way, when you eat low carb diet, you need more sodium. Low carb diets, your body loses lots of water. You need more sodium. You you actually lose lots of sodium with a low carb diet. Or if you eat a whole natural food diet, again, like we said earlier, your your sodium is very low. And I remember when we when we all tried it, the pumps improved, the energy improved because it had a decent amount of sodium, along with, of course, the potassium and magnesium. So if you're that person who's active and fit, and you eat whole natural foods. And you're still like, ah, oh, man, my energy's not super good. Like, what's going on? Mm -hmm. Try increasing your sodium. You might just trip yourself out at how big of uh, impact it has. Yeah. All right, this next one, this one's dear, near and dear. I think both, especially to you guys, and I'd say probably Justin even more so. Yes, it is. <laughs> you might be having too much caffeine. You know, caffeine is an incredible chemical. It's of course it's naturally occurring. It's one of the most effective. If not the most it's effective, a godsend. Yeah, yeah, athletic performance enhancing compound. It reduces risk of dementia. It can improve health of the brain. It can improve mental function. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. We've been consuming it for thousands of years. However, it comes along with side effects, which include fatigue. By the way, caffeine can produce fatigue at too high a levels. You'll actually find that you'll crash hard and be more tired uh, than you were before. It contributes to anxiety, heart palpitations, uh, hormone imbalances. I find this often with women where their cortisol is very high and estrogen and progesterone levels are off balance. And that's because with caffeine, there's a sweet spot. And taking more caffeine just results in more of the negative side effects and very little or none of those positive effects. So you just may, may be taking, especially if you have coffee and a pre-workout, like a lot of people do this. They have coffee every morning, then they throw a pre-workout before their workout. They never take a day off and uh, they're not realizing that the caffeine that they're taking in is, is just too much. It's just A lot of negative. times it's the glue that's like barely holding everything together too. <laughs> yeah. Like I know a lot of uses, and myself included, uh, have used caffeine to really just keep, keep me going, keep me productive throughout the day and really mask over a lot of the symptoms like my body's trying to tell me like in terms of not getting enough quality sleep, uh, being not drinking enough water, uh, a lot of these other things that I should be doing, uh, I tend to then over overcompensate with caffeine because now I can get this sort of false energy at least for an extended amount of time, but then that inevitably adds up to upping your dose and then this causes, uh, you know, interrupts your sleep uh, later on in the day uh, and all kinds of things, uh, you know, spirals out from there. So I actually don't think this was that big of a deal when we first started as trainers. I've seen this uh, increase dramatically mm -hmm. in the last You're right. decade. Yes. The first 10 years or even first five years for sure that we were trained. I mean, that Starbucks was like still on that wasn't even on the scene yet. So mm -hmm. when Starbucks hit the scene, only people that drink coffee were like old people. Yes. Uh, the hardcore truckers, yeah, and, journalists, yeah. 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 like <laughs> teachers. You didn't see fitness people drinking coffee no. back then. It became something that became normalized after, after the introduction of Starbucks. Mm -hmm. And then after that, you started to see, because up until that point too, it was an old person thing. It was like, ah, it didn't taste very good. Not very many people I knew drank it. 
Then it became like this ritual that everybody stopped and had their mm -hmm. Starbucks coffee. Then came all the positive studies that would start to come out because before that too, it was like, oh, it's just like any other drug you get addicted to. It's not ideal for everybody. And so we didn't really normalize it yet. Then Starbucks, everybody's doing it. And then we found to connect, make all these great connections to how beneficial mm -hmm. caffeine is. And now we've swung the complete opposite direction where you see kids in Starbucks now. You see they, they, have, they make drinks now that attract these little kids. Oh, yeah, and milkshakes with it. So. That, yeah. So it has become very normal for people. To, and then you see the pre-workout market also come out of nowhere. During, that didn't exist. That didn't exist either during our time. So the beginning of our career, this was not a conversation at all. Nope. Midway, I start to realize, wow, how much this is growing. It's not until not that long ago do I start to piece together, oh, wow, this is starting to become a problem because it's becoming so normalized. Everybody is drinking multiple cups a day. And then now this pre-workout market is exploding. Mm -hmm. And now the race on the pre-workout market is to stay ahead of everybody's addiction. So the original 150 to 200 milligram That was the original dose, yes. 200 milligrams. Yeah, 150, 200 was like a big deal originally. And that became not a big deal anymore. And then it became 250, then 300. Then you see some of these push pushing four, 450 milligrams of caffeine in a pre-workout on top of them probably having a cup of coffee. Yeah, and it cements the idea that you need that before every workout, which is not true. And a lot of times I've noticed some people like they won't even work out unless they have their pre-workout mm -hmm. ahead of time, uh, which is a problem because then that dependency is really something that you have to work. The biggest negative effect that I see from it is uh, how much it disrupts people's sleep when they don't even realize it disrupts their mm -hmm. sleep. Yeah. Because you don't think sometimes when you have this pre-workout at two or three o'clock in the afternoon before you go get your workout in, that how is that how does that have anything to do with me at night at nine thirty or ten o'clock in bed tossing and turning? And you don't connect the two unless you've paid attention long enough and you tease it out to to measure it, which I have done, and it blows my mind what a difference it makes when I have either limited or no caffeine on how much better sleep Did I Did you get. know that studies show that almost always caffeine affects sleep? Yes. Almost always. Yeah. Even if you have it in the morning. Now, there's a degree, there's of course degrees to how much it affects your sleep, but it almost, in fact, if you go to a sleep expert and you have issues with sleep, the first thing they'll do is have you reduce or eliminate your caffeine. You know, you didn't even cover the energy drink market. Yeah. I remember, okay, I don't know if you guys yeah, remember right. this. When we were kids, there was one drink that advertised itself as having a lot of caffeine, Jolt, Jolt. Cola. Yeah. yeah, remember that? Yeah. You know how much caffeine Jolt like, Cola had? Like fifty. It was like sixty or seventy. Yeah, I think it was you know, 50. It, it, it was in, in, like in a, a small can. cup of coffee. Yeah, and you drink it and be like, "Oh my god, it's so energized!" You know, then Red Bull comes out, and now you've got Rock Stars and all these other drinks that are just packed full of caffeine. There's also this huge individual variance when it comes to caffeine tolerance. You know, I know if you read the studies, they say, oh, up to 300 milligrams a day or three cups a day is perfectly fine. That's so bullshit. It's not true for a lot of people. For some people, it's true. For other people, anything over 100 milligrams causes more negative than positive effects. Yeah, yeah. You have to uh, figure this out kind of for yourself. I have, in comparison to my co-host, a low tolerance. But I know people who have an even lower tolerance. In fact, I was working out with a friend of mine the other day, and he said if he just has a green tea, which is like 50 milligrams or less, he feels negative. He just totally stays away from caffeine completely. So he's on the other end of the spectrum. But you need to know this for yourself. Caffeine in high doses, because it causes a stress response in the body, it's what makes you hyped, can really negatively affect your hormones as well. So keep this in mind. If you have hormone issues, can't figure out what's going on, it just might be the excessive And it's a vicious it. cycle because mm -hmm. you, you you start to do it, it throws off the sleep, you're miserable the next day. You, you need feel more. You need more just to get yep. you up again. And it's like, you can't imagine going a few days without yeah. it. And so, yeah, this has been one of those things that early on in my career, I never thought to ask it, where now it becomes one of the first 15 things that I, as I'm going through the list of, have we done your water? Have we done, totally. have you checked your caffeine? Have you tried to go a week without caffeine and paid attention to your sleep? Totally. Now this next one, I feel like is targeting me a little bit, uh, but it's true. <laughs> Uh, and yeah. this is that you might Sorry, just that be one's hit me hard last one. You, you you might just be taking too many supplements. Um, and there's a couple of reasons why this is a problem. One, you don't know what's doing what. You know, if you're taking four different supplements or five different supplements, you don't know it, which one is making you feel good, which one is making you not feel good, which one is causing gut issues or none of that stuff. You have no idea because there's just so many products and supplements that you're taking. Um, and by the way. Some supplements that are supposed to make people feel great actually can make other people feel really bad. I'll give right. you guys an example, right? 
if you look up the studies on rhodiola, rhodiola is a supplement that's it's an herb or a plant. It's been around forever. It's been used for hundreds of years. It's a it's a it's a tonic. It, imp- it strengthens uh, your immune system. It's an adaptogenic, meaning it allows your body to adapt to stress better. It improves athletic performance and energy and alertness. All the studies show this. Okay, all the studies show this. It's very very. It's pretty conclusive. It does all these wonderful things. It makes me feel like shit. Yep. If I take rhodiola and I take anything other than the smallest dose of all time, like if I take a normal dose of rhodiola, I literally feel bogged down and feverish. I don't feel good. Now, if I'm taking five different supplements or 10 different supplements, or I'm taking one supplement with 10 different ingredients, one of them is rhodiola, like I don't know if it's the rhodiola or is it the cordyceps in there? What the hell is going on that's making me feel real terrible? You just might be taking too many supplements. Yeah, no, and you and I are the same way when it comes to that. I didn't piece this together until I started to notice I had clients that were like you and like myself. I think we were we all a little bit this. Like I definitely, as a kid, tried every supplement under the sun, and you know, a lot of people are searching for that, even if they don't they don't realize they are subconsciously they're always asking what's the best pill for this or what's the best for that or i heard about this or what do you know about that supplement because they've been marketed to or a friend told them about it and then when you find out what they're taking they've got seven different pills that they're taking to try and help them burn fat build muscle sleep better (laughs) wake up better like all these things and sometimes a lot of them are conflicting with each other so you're 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 taking one upper with a downer and you're doing all these things to that you're in pursuit of this better physique or more energy and what you don't realize is it's just it, they're either counteracting you with each other or just the combination of all of them is upsetting you and so that becomes a now on my list well i think in general too because it's in the health category a lot of times you're going to the store and uh, these are all um vitamins and and supplements so and you assume nutrients, positive and you assume like more is always better yeah you know? Know. If, obviously if i'm obviously if i'm not getting it in my food it's going to benefit me and it's a lot of times yeah people will get into that sort of mode of i i need I need vitamin C, I need vitamin D, I need fish oil, I need this, I need that. And, and, you know, not really even associating a lot of those things with what your current diet is providing. That's a really good point, too. This was something I found out later on was, you know, especially if you do a lot of like shakes and bars and things that have... They're all fortified. That's right. They're all fortified. And many of them will give you the total RDA of like one nutrient that you need for the entire day. And so did the other thing. And then so did the other thing. So you got three things that are giving you your complete RDA for the day and they're, you're overdoing it. And there's a lot of things that are not better the more you no, do. No, fat-soluble vitamins. Like, okay, so vitamin D deficiency is quite common. But if you're somebody that's got high levels of vitamin D at the upper level, upper limit, and you supplement with vitamin D, you can cause yourself some big problems because you're taking a supplement that your body specifically doesn't need. You brought up an excellent point, Adam. Look at your pre-workout, look at your protein shakes, look at all your products and see how many of them contain the same stuff, not realizing that you're overdoing a few key nutrients that could be building up in your body. You know, uh, there's fat soluble vitamins and minerals, they get stored in the body. So you gotta be very, very careful, you know, with, with that kind of stuff. Here's another one, and this one's very common, especially in the fitness space, which is you just you're working out too much. In fact, we just answered a live question uh, the other day on, on our live Q and A episode, and this this young lady is talking about all her exercise and workouts, and she wants to know why she can't push her body to get to the next level. And it became very obvious to me that she was overdoing it. You know, there's a big difference between how much workload your body can tolerate and how much workload is ideal to get your body right. to adapt and feel good and get stronger. There's a very big difference. They're not the same. Yeah. Like there's an there's a certain amount of volume, sets and reps that'll optimize my performance, will build muscle, will make me feel good. And then there's a, an amount that's much higher than that that is pushing the limit in terms of how much I can tolerate. But by because I pushed it to that point where I can barely tolerate it. I've slowed down my progress. I'm tapping into too much energy and my body is always kind of tiptoeing that line between overtraining and the right amount, which means you don't feel good. You don't feel very good when you're constantly pushing how much exercise you can tolerate versus what's optimal for adaptation. Well, I think, so this has made it number six on our list and they're not necessarily in any particular order because I would actually rank this up even higher because 
I found, and and this is true with myself. I mean, uh, and this is where the whole saying of you know my goal is to do as little as possible to elicit the most amount of change, and that's a mantra that I continually tell myself because you have to. Yeah, because it just we tend to overreach, and that that's talking for sure to the fitness fanatic. But even the person who is not a fitness fanatic, but is just motivated to get started on their 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 journey. Yeah, they're yeah. fired up. They're they tired. Take it all on. That's right. They let's. I want to do as much as I can because that you assume that the the more you do, the more results you get, and it doesn't work that way. So I actually think this is one of the top reasons why someone's not progressing or not feeling well is they are just hammering their body. They're giving it too much yeah. at once. Many times they're doing that also in a, cal a caloric deficit. So they're on a yeah. diet. So they're restricting their body of some of these things we're talking about, water, sodium, calories. And then on top of that, you're also pushing it way more than you need to. Yeah, yeah. And then wondering why I'm not getting the results. That yeah, I want. a lot of times it's the last thing people even consider because what's promoted so much uh, in in like general in the general population in, in the public view is that you need to be exercising more and you're never doing enough and so for somebody that has been actively motivated and pushing their body to its limits uh, it has to be good for me and so that wouldn't have been even something that they would have thought if I reduce this it's going to make my body feel better and I'm, I'm actually going to progress more towards the direction that I want yeah the, the dose has to be perfect for your body and that considers your lifestyle, your sleep, your goals, your fitness level, the right dose will get you there faster. More than that will get you there slower. A lot more than that will get you to go backwards. Always remember that. I can't tell you how many times I had clients hire me and I got their bodies to progress rapidly by cutting their volume down by a third. Like that's all I would do. I'd look at their workout and be like, yeah. here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a third less work. And I, they would always argue with me and I'd say, look, here's the deal. You're paying me and you do trust me. Let's do this for a few weeks. I promise you, if you trust me this one time, I'll never have to ask for your trust again. It's one of my favorite lines. And they would listen. Be like, okay. Oh my God, I'm getting stronger. What's going on? I'm doing less work. You were doing too much before. It was the it was too much. Your body couldn't adapt. It was only worried uh, about healing. All right, here's another one. That's a, that's a big one. This one you see. I used to see in gyms all the time. Remember, we managed big box gyms for years. That's how we all kind of started our career. And when you're in a gym and you're running it, you're there a lot, right? So especially as a general manager, I would be there from 9 a.m. typically till 9 p.m. And you start to see the same people. There's a certain percentage of your members that are real consistent, and you'd see them come in. And you'd see them work out. And then after a while, I'd notice these people do the exact same thing every, every single, single time. time they came in. I mean, there's one guy, I remember, he would come in literally always exactly the same thing. And not only the exact same thing, the exact same piece of equipment. So I'd have a, lo I'd have a row of Stairmasters. Nope, he would get on the third Stairmaster. 15 minutes, the same favorite one. They need to go over to this chest press machine. Then they do this row machine. And it was always the same way. It always used the same way. And I would watch this guy do this all the time. And I remember talking to him and we got in this conversation. I'm like, hey, man, you're real consistent. I see you coming in, you know, every day at, at 3 p.m. doing your workout. You know, do you have any, you know, any questions or anything? He's like, well, you know, it's really fun, but I, I, my body's plateaued. Like, I, I don't, I just stopped responding. I'm like, well, I watch you work out. You know, you do the exact same thing every single time you come in. Well, yeah, I got a good routine. Well, yeah, but your body got used to it. Let's change it up and watch what happens. And of course he did and he got results. This is actually quite common with people where they do the same stuff all the time. Maybe not ex the same like the guy I just talked about, right. but they do the same rep ranges or they always do the same exercises or the same kind of body part split uh, or they're always bodybuilding and they never try powerlifting or they never try functional exercise. Right. Like if you're always doing the same thing, you're always pressing the same weaknesses. You can cause joint issues. You tend to cause imbalances in your body because you're not working in different planes. This can cause problems if you never change up your workouts. Yeah. Yeah, or they're the kind of person that um, has always done a specific type of plan, but they've taken a few years off, and now they're jumping right back into that kind of plan that worked for them years ago. So they didn't change it. They so just they went. didn't change anything, <laughs> but they try and apply it, and it's it doesn't have the same type of success and progress that they had before because their body's different now, and they haven't accounted for that, and they haven't uh, really gradually brought themselves back into shape even to uh, meet and face that type of demand on their body. So. So, uh, yeah, it's the creature habit. It's the something, you know, that's the familiar. Like, we're, we're all guilty of, of sort of being drawn back into what's familiar to us and what we know we can do. Mm -hmm. I really think this is the difference between uh, people that exercise and people that train. 
So movement, any kind of movement can be exercise. Zumba class is exercise. You can do the same exercise uh, forever your, and your, your heart rate elevates. and It's, it's better than nothing. That's right. It's not yeah, bad it's for you. just movement, really. That's right. It's not bad for you. But many times this is, uh, this is confused with training and training is a goal. I have a goal in mind. I come to this gym and I am trying to either get stronger, get faster, lose, lose body fat, build muscle. I have a goal in mind and therefore the work that I'm doing, the intent is that I am bettering myself towards that where if you're just going to exercise to exercise, that's fine. I mean, if you want to write, do the four machines, Sal talked about the guy and, and you're happy. I with, bet you guys know who I'm talking about. I do you guys know, manage I really the same do. gym. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you guys know my, exactly. My first example yeah, is like Stairmaster. I, I, yeah. yeah. I know who he is for sure. Uh, so, you know, that, fine. But if you tell me you, you're, you're wanting to make change or you don't feel good or you don't like what's happening – and this is how you approach it. It's like you, you got to change your routine up. And it's hard because we do. We get stuck in the things that we like in our habits. And, you know, but if you have a goal or you want to change, that the idea is that you're training and not just exercising. Yeah. Now, the next one, this one, people are always like, oh, yeah, I know that. Yeah, I do that. But do you really? And that's sleep quality. Your sleep quality sucks. Now, I've talked to many people about sleep, many clients. And oftentimes I'll hear, but I get eight hours every single night. Right. I'm not talking about how long you think you sleep or when you go to bed and when you get out of bed, but rather the quality of sleep within. Now, I'm going to use an extreme example just to kind of illustrate my point. I remember I had a client who was dealing with fatigue and you know uh, inflammation and just couldn't figure out what the hell was going on. Finally, we narrowed it down and they went and saw, did a sleep study. I don't know if you guys know what a sleep study is, but you go and you actually sleep in a lab. They watch you and they figure out what's going on. And they found that this person had sleep apnea and that they were actually waking up several times in the night. They weren't aware of it, but they were waking up several times a night. So this person got one of those, those CPAP machines, put it on, and it was life changing. I'll never forget the day after they wore it, they walked into my gym and they're like, if I knew this years ago, I would have done this. Like I am a different person because of last night. I had no idea that my sleep quality <laughs> was that bad. So although they went to bed and woke up, you know, and had eight hours, the reality is they got like five hours of quality. So every night they were sleep deprived. Now that's an extreme example, mm -hmm. but if you're waking up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom or you wake up because you're uncomfortable or because you're sweating or because the sheets are, and this is common for you, your sleep quality probably isn't great. And you need to focus on things that improve sleep quality, like turning off electronics an hour before bed or wearing blue light blocking glasses, making sure your room is really cool, 66, 67 degrees, maybe wearing minimal clothing in bed, not eating too close uh, to, to bedtime. Like those are just a few common things, but they make a huge difference. And you'll go to the bed at the same time, wake up at the same time, but the quality within yeah. having a plan and, and preparing for sleep. Yes. It's, I, I just think that that's still a common thing that a lot of people don't consider. Uh, they just want to, okay, now it's time for bed. And whether or not you're watching TV or you're on your phone, uh, answering your last email, and then you set your phone down and now it's just close my eyes and it's magically going to happen and I'm going <laughs> to sleep and all this stuff's going to be great. Meanwhile, your brain is still completely active mm -hmm. and you haven't been able to really shift over uh, into that different uh, mindset. And so to, to create that uh, is going to take a lot of intent uh, going into that. So the the hour preceding that to, to really be conscious of how much blue light you're introducing yourself to and making sure you, you actually have a ritual leading up into taking, you know, going to, to sleep is, is going to be a huge difference. I can't remember who it was that I first heard that from, um, but I remember that was probably some of the best advice I'd ever heard. And up in, up until this point, um, I was somebody who just, oh, I'll sleep when I'm sleep when I'm dead and sleep is yeah, overrated. I said that so many times. Yeah, I was definitely that asshole for a very long time. Uh, and it wasn't until later did I start to really appreciate quality sleep. And then it wasn't until I heard this, and I wish I remember who who said this first, but it was kind of like an aha moment for a, even somebody like me who's a trainer and who should know better. Is that, you know, we put all of this effort into starting our day off, you know, so we have such a great day, you know, and that you're productive throughout the day and you have this, everyone has a morning routine, whether you, you think you do or not, you do whatever you do every single morning is your routine and 
most people at the bare minimum have the go to the bathroom, brush your teeth, shower, yeah, you know, yeah, get we're your, not talking about that. Yeah. Have a cup of coffee. I mean, it's, but you have a routine that you do every single morning to set the tone for your day. And some people even more extensive. And then you ask the majority of people, what does your night look like? And most people, well, you know, sometimes this, sometimes that around this or, and then I just close my eyes and try to go to sleep. Yeah. There's, <laughs> there is no effort put towards maybe some of the most important time of the day when they talk when you talk about recovery and energy and building muscle longevity overall health mood all the things that sleep impacts you can make the case that the, that, that the eight hours right there is probably the most important eight hours a day yet there's no effort whatsoever that's put around that and so a great place to start somebody and what I began doing with clients is just asking that, like, what is your sleep routine? Nine times out of 10 getting a don't really have one. Well, let's build one. Mm -hmm. And then that's kind of how you start with this. And, you know, it, it can start off very basic to get in some good habits that you both alluded to the television and phone. I think that's the easiest thing that I always tell clients to do first is like, OK, let before I build this huge routine for you, let's first just get rid of what I think are some of the worst habits, which is laying in your bed, staring at a screen because you're basically telling the brain it's daytime when it's 11 o'clock at night in your bed. So let's agree that one hour before you lay down, there's no more screen time, no television and start there. And then you start to build. And what you find is the more healthy habits that you build around the evening to help you get better sleep, the better sleep you get, and then the better all those other oh, things yeah. are. And so this is something that took me a long time, but then has become probably one of the, the top five staple ones that I address when talking yeah, to and figuring out things like you'd mentioned in terms of being like overheated and sweating oh, yeah. and that waking you up. Like there's beautiful technology out there now that exists to be able to cool you and keep your temperature pretty much controlled at night. And, you know, these are products that are game changing for a lot of people, just like finding out, you know, you have sleep apnea. So yeah. to, to, to go through that process and figure out what it is that's really like preventing you from quality sleep is a, a dire importance. Yeah. So this next one, um, I noticed quite a bit, especially with my kids, since they were not able to go to school during the pandemic. Um, because they did their school at home on their computers. Therefore, they stayed in their rooms all day long until I got home. Um, and I noticed that they were just starting to look more and more like the walking dead. Like I'd come in and I'd see my kid and I'd be like, man, you look like Neo from the Matrix before <laughs> he wakes up, you know, that real pale kind of... And so I started to just, I, every day I would come home and be like, we're going for one hour walk no matter what going outside. And they would him and ha, yes. I don't want to... And we go outside, and within 20, 30 minutes, their moods would totally change. Yep. So one of the problems might be that you're just indoors too much. You're just never outside. Going outside makes a huge difference. So much energy you get just from the sunlight or just from being outside and getting fresh air. We notice it here. We're in a studio yeah. when we're recording the podcast. Um, but And there's many times where in between podcasts, we're like, we need to go for a walk, even if it's only 20 minutes, let's go outside. Man, we come back inside and we're invigorated. It's total different energy. Well, I would say that this is uh, for sure one of the ones that we all are, are hard on ourselves about, or we would agree that if there's uh, of these 15 we're going through, where do we slip up the most? I would say here, because we do have this job that we're in this cave where we work. And so it's very easy that we, we can get stuck in here all day long. And so this is one that I'm always having to remind myself to get out there and get out. And, and I always notice it's, I notice the difference immediately. That's why th this one's easy for me to, to show clients the difference. Like it's pretty obvious if you're somebody who sits in, at a desk under fluorescent lights all day long Take that same person and give them a day at the beach for a day and then ask them how the hell oh, they yeah. feel all day. It's like you night and day difference. Yeah, so yeah. you can feel it immediately. It's just you have to be conscious of the uh, of the fact that you may not be getting it on a regular basis. And then you have to make that effort. Otherwise, you could string. I mean, I know I could string weeks together <laughs> without seeing. Yeah. the sun. Yeah, without almost seeing the sun, getting to work so early, it's barely coming up yeah. and you're in your car and then you go straight to a building and then you stay here all night. And then before you know, you go like, oh, shit, it's been like a week since I actually oh, speaking to the beach. I mean, just going there and getting that kind of sun exposure and, and how your body just it just absorbs and craves that type of uh 
uh, stimulus. And, and, and what that does too later on for the night, I, like some of the best sleep I have ever had uh, is after I've been able to kind of introduce more sun again when I've been deprived mm. of sun. It's really interesting. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Uh, evolutionarily speaking, if you spent as much time indoors for most of human history as we tend to do now, it's because you were sick. Humans never spent this much. We, you, if you were in a cave, 90% of the time, it's because you were sick and you were away from the rest of the tribe because you had some weird disease or you're about to die. So our bodies almost read it the same way. I'm inside all day long, no sun exposure, no yeah. fresh air, and my body's receiving the signal that's almost like, I'm sick, I guess I'm not well, and you feel that well, way. Well, there's a healing aspect to it, and this is something I talked to Courtney about. She's a nurse, and with you know sick kids would make a point to, to take them outside and yes. wheel them outside and get them some sun. It was like really important uh, for their recovery process. Well, have you ever felt that loop before that you're describing? I mean, I was just sick not that long ago, and I felt this right where you're you feel terrible so you lay in bed all day it's dark and you just for and you just feel worse and worse and worse and then i know i gotta get out and so i'll drag my ass out to my backyard sit in there and just absorb the sun and like instantly feel better I right know, away i know so it's like this loop that you don't feel good you tell yourself you're not feeling good all the signs you're around in this dark room it's just telling you not you're not getting better anytime soon but simply dragging your ass outside and getting the sun immediately you can feel oh difference. yeah and you, if you work on a computer take your laptop outside that's all right. you can you can work outside and in get some of the benefits of being outdoors without uh, you know, having to stop what you're doing. All right, so this next one is really interesting because uh, over the last year, my wife has almost eliminated social media. So she's taken herself off of social media for the most part. And the improvement, so the improvement of her in, her, in terms of her, her health, her mental health, she tells me she's way less stressed, way less, way less anxious. It's been, tr it's been tremendous. Social media, although it's a valuable tool, and a way you can communicate to people. Man, if you spend a lot of time on social media, you're going to feel like shit because you're either A, comparing yourself to everybody's highlight reel, or B, you're getting targeted with trigger type articles you, that are guaranteed you're just to do arguing that. arguing all day long <laughs> right. for no reason with somebody that may not even be a real person. Uh, but they've obviously got you, uh, you, you uh, got under your skin, got you going, and you're very much like engaged, and that follows you throughout the rest of your day, which affects your mood and the way you interact with other people. I mean, it's definitely something you need yeah. to check go, yourself. Go out. on social media with intention. So tell yourself, I'm going to go on for 30 minutes to to just you know scroll, or I'm going on for 30 minutes to learn something or to write something, and that's it. The whole like wasting time on social media makes you feel like shit. In fact, I know psychologists. Today, a lot of them now are recommending to people reduce their time on social media to reduce people's anxiety. Yeah. I, I think this is a conversation that I was not used to having as a trainer, and I've had it more now as a podcaster than I, I ever It had. wasn't a thing. When yeah, we were it, it wasn't a thing at all. And I do see um, how important it is to – if you're a coach and a trainer today and you, and you help – uh, clients out, I think this should be in your top three for sure, because I think almost everybody is on social media. And what happens with clients when they set these goals, and I, I, I don't know a client, I, I'm sure you guys have heard if, if people that that are signing up with training today, almost all of them will reference like an Instagram person is like what they want to look like. Like when mm -hmm. I look at my niece and I look mm -hmm. at, they have goals. They, when they talk to me about their yeah. goals, they refer to another person on Instagram or on Facebook. Like, Oh, I, I want to look like her. I want, and that is such a terrible place to start. I mean, you shouldn't even, you shouldn't ever go there. You definitely shouldn't start there. It's like, Oh, I have this goal in mind and you're already comparing yourself to this other person who, again, like Sal said, presenting a highlight reel of their life. Like one, who knows if it's even real Two, that's a terrible place psychologically to be, to be constantly comparing yourself to other people. So I feel like if you're feeling down, you don't feel good or you have, you're anxious or whatever. One of the first things that I would tell someone today would be to, I would go ahead and go through their Instagram and say, let's get rid of all this bullshit you're following. Yeah, I think definitely that, the comparison part of that, but also like, what is your input? Like, what what are you taking in and consuming and reading and allowing uh, within your day? And so like social media, like you're going to get a lot in, in a short amount of time in terms of your feed and what kind of people are you following? Are they positive? Is it all negative doom and gloom? Like, what are you bringing mm -hmm. in uh, psychologically? 
psychologically that you're going to carry with you throughout the rest of the day. Yeah, well, here's another one. Uh, you you just might be surrounded by shitty people, or your friends. <laughs> yeah. Your friends might just suck. I remember reading. I remember it was like three years ago that I brought up the study that blew all of our minds. It was a Stanford study, and it showed that having bad relationships in your life was as bad for you as smoking, I think, a pack of cigarettes every single day. It was a day. lot. I think it was even more than that. Yeah, it's, it's, that's how bad it is for your health. Now, you might be thinking, well, what do you mean? How do I know that my friends suck? Or yeah, a lot of people don't know that. that okay. <laughs> or, they're Here, the, or they're the sucky friend. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> well, Maybe you. you. Yeah. Here, here's, oh, no. a, here's a litmus test. <laughs> good friends celebrate your victories. They, they're more excited about good things that happen to you than you are. And they also mourn your losses. So if you have friends that you bring like good news, oh my God, I just got promoted. And they kind of come off a little negative or a little bit critical. Like, oh, well, yeah, probably not a good friend. Or if you have something bad happen to you and your friend kind of doesn't care or doesn't really come to your to your to help you or show that they're sad along with you that's probably not uh, a good friend mm -hmm. and this may mean and i've done this in my life actually several times that you need to prune certain people off your life there may be some friends that you need to slowly start to ghost and start over and find better people because you tend to become kind of the average of the people you surround yeah. yourself are with. your friends growth minded are they doing things that uh, you aspire to do? Are they motivating and and showing you, uh, you know how to how to live a certain way that you really admire? And just those things, like you, you want to be able to surround yourself with people that elevate you, but also you know uh, are examples of different aspects of life that you can incorporate within yourself. Uh, and, and so to to find to find different groups of friends really hard because it's comfortable uh, to be around the ones that have sort of stayed the same and, you, and it's mm. very predictable and obvious, but uh, is that going to be good for you long term? Something you have to kind of deal with and, and really address. Well, I don't know who coined the, uh, you're the average of the five people you hang out the most with, but I believe that I, and I think it was referring originally to like financial health, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, if you're, if you took what your four best friends incomes are, like you typically end up landing in an average of those four or whatever yeah. like that they say. And I think that's where it, the origin of it. I think, but I really do believe that it applies to all aspects. Like you're just you're an average of their of their their how positive they are, how growth minded they are, how physically fit they are. You you know totally. you really are totally. like an average of your five because that's your circle who you compare yourself to. Whether you believe you are or not, you are you're doing yeah. that. And and that means if you change them, your average changes. Yes. How many times have you done that? How many times have you? Notice you want to improve something in your life. Look at the the you know maybe there's a few friends that you have. And you're like man they do not support like maybe your friends like to drink a lot and you're thinking I want to improve my health and so you say you know we only really connect over alcohol. I'm going to kind of stop hanging out with them and I'm going to start hanging out with maybe more health oriented people and then that changes your average and brings you up to a completely different level. Well, and a lot of times yeah. that's who's the, the client that I get that's guilty of this. They are they're the best one of the five. And the other four are bringing them down. Mm -hmm. And there's a there's a part of us that get attracted to that. It feels good. It feels good to look at your peers and go like, oh, I'm kind of winning. Yeah. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. You know, Sal doesn't have a job. Justin's really fat. You know, I feel like <laughs> yeah. I feel like I'm doing I'm, things. I'm you killing know? it. Yeah, I'm killing it. Like, I have a job. I'm not so fat. You know what I'm saying? Like, I feel pretty good about myself. But put yourself in a room. Adam's a hoarder. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, put yourself in a room where now you are the bottom of that five. And what it will naturally do is bring your average up. And so this is is definitely this especially when i'm talking to younger younger kids or my my nieces or nephews that are in their 20s like this i think this was some of the best advice that was given to me took me a long time to be comfortable with letting go or moving on with relationships yeah. that i was attached to for a long time but 100 percent elevate elevated my game yeah this next one is is actually becoming a bigger deal these days and that's that you feel like you have uh no purpose you know what this reminds me of um fight club remember the movie fight club yeah where uh, not brad pitt who's the other guy what's his name that actually edward, edward norton, norton. Edward norton. Norton. Remember his character initially? He'd get up, go to work, do the same thing. And it, you know, he was taking care of himself, you know, he was earning a living. But obviously, you could tell he felt like he had no purpose, like he was just floating along. This is much more common these days because of all the distractions that we have. There's so much entertainment. There's so many things that we can do. We're very comfortable. Yeah. Luckily, society's become quite wealthy. So for the most part, people got kind of what they need. And they feel like something's missing. I have no purpose. And by the way, purpose tends to come with challenge. This is another one. I've had friends, no joke. And this is uh, you know, shout out to people in the military. 
I've had friends who felt like this so strongly in high school that they went and joined the military because they felt like it would give them purpose. And many of them, it did. Yeah. Many of them, they came back and they said it was life-changing because it gave them a sense of purpose. And of course, there's many different ways to do this. But yeah. if you lack purpose in your life, you can have all the stuff that you need, but you feel like you're just floating around in the wind. And well, that doesn't feel good. And I think that community is a big piece to that. It's a big component. And I think that People might think that they're part of a community based off of who they interact with occasionally or they have like communities online where they might have this type of communication between other people. But really, like to find that that community that you feel like you're part of something that's greater than yourself, and you're giving a lot of yourself yes. to it, uh, is something to really consider and really find that opportunity to serve and and to 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 do something outside of of just your own needs. I think if if people could work more in that direction, a lot of times purpose reveals itself. Yeah, volunteer work is a great way right. to do that. Yeah, I, I'm not going to try and because uh, I think this is a hard one. It's a it's a hard one to tell somebody, right? So I I. I I know that it's important. I know that a lot of people lack this, and I, I feel like it's growing how many people lack this. Uh, but I also know there's such a huge individual variance of what this looks like. Uh, I will give you some books, though, that I think that are, are really good. The ones that come to mind right away are uh, Start With Why, mm -hmm. uh, A Purpose Driven Life, um, and then uh, The Alchemist. I think those three books, if you are somebody right now who's listening and you're like, oh, this is me, like I just don't really have the drive or feel like I have any purpose and I'm kind of waffling around, like what should I do? Like read those books. I mean, I think that will help help maybe guide you in the direction of what your purpose looks like because it is very different for mm -hmm. every person and, sure. and you have to figure that out for yourself. This, the next one is connected to it, which is you don't take any responsibility. Uh, you don't take any responsibility for the circumstances of your life. It's easy to sit down and say, wow, life sucks because all these uncontrollable circumstances. I only had one parent or I grew up poor or this terrible thing happened to me, or there was this accident that happened that I was at, a, you know, that I didn't control. And although all those things probably impacted or had very strong impacts on where you're at, because you can't control them, you're just, you're leaving yourself to the whims of the uncontrollable. Rather than taking responsibility and saying, what am I responsible for? And, uh, and, and what can I do about those particular things that I'm responsible for? It's also just not taking responsibility in life. You know, years ago, I had this, this kid that I trained. I, I trained this, these, this couple, and then they brought me their son, and he was a bit of a troubled youth. He was, they, were, they were quite wealthy, successful. He was a smart kid, but he was starting to have some trouble with drugs and, he, you know, some certain issues. So they signed him up for one of those, like, camps for troubled youth. And what the camp did with this kid is they actually put, they actually made him a squad leader and he was responsible for all these other kids and getting their you know, breakfast set up and make sure they set up camp. The fact that he had responsibility over these other kids made him rise to the occasion. In fact, when he came back from this, what he told me, he said, you know, the changing, the, the thing that really made a big difference for me was I actually had responsibility and it made me rise to the occasion. So oftentimes, and Arthur Brooks talks about this. It's a key to happiness. You have to be responsible for stuff. You have to take responsibility. Yeah, this reminds me of an image, and it used to be in one of the offices that I worked in. I don't remember which one. I just remember seeing the image, and I, you talking about this right now made me Google it real quick, and that was an accountability ladder. I don't know if you've ever seen the the, the image of that. Not a long time. Seen yeah, that. so it's a, it's an eight-step ladder, and the, the first four steps represent victim behaviors and basically being powerless, and then the top four, when you start moving your way up, up the ladders, where accountability ability behaviors and powerful becomes. And so the very first rung, the very bottom of it is unaware and unconscious. It's like you've no clue that you mm -hmm. have no clue, right? And then the very first step up from there is you blame others. Okay, you're aware shit's going wrong and it's all bad, but you point the finger and blame others. And then the second one is you make personal excuses. Oh, it's everybody else's fault. And it's like, oh, life is so hard for me. Uh, the third one is I can't. I just can't do it. It's, it's just impossible for me to do this. And then the last one on the victim is the, the wait and hope. Like, oh, okay, I recognize I have things that are hard, but it's going to get better. I'll just wait for it. I'll have faith. I'll have faith that it'll end up working out down the road. It's not until you get to the next rung where you start to move into accountability. And that's acknowledging reality. Like this is waking the fuck up, the owning your situation. Uh, and second one that the next rung up is embracing it, realizing like, okay, I'm in this situation. What do I do here? Next one is finding that solution. And then the last one is making it happen. So I used to love that. That's that a it, great, that's good, yeah. I haven't seen that in a long time. It's so good. Right. It's so powerful. And I think we, a lot of people 
tend to find themselves in that that lower portion where totally. they're, they're powerless and and they they're really not going to see much advancement or feeling better in life until they start to make their way yeah, up. It's that hard ladder. to face adversity a lot of, a lot of times like that and realize like you're a big component in that and uh, you know to be able to to acknowledge it I think is, is is a major step in the right direction. You know this is the key to health and fitness success. This is the absolute key. In fact. What you'll find, this is one of the things I love most about fitness, is if you stick to it long enough, it makes you feel empowered because to, in order to get fit and to stay fit, you have to take responsibility. You can't say, it's my genetics, it's the way I was brought up, it's my bone structure, uh, You know, my parents were overweight, my mm -hmm. parents are unathletic. At some point, you stick to it long enough, you say, okay, all those things are true, so what? This is what yeah, I can do about what? it. Here's what I can do about it. I can work out this way. I can eat this way. I can be consistent. It's 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 a part of fitness success is taking responsibility, owning what you can own, and forgetting the stuff that you 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 can't own. Um, the next one. This is a this is one for people who, when they get in kind of a motivated state, they tend to want to do like 15 things at one time, and that's that they lack focus. Right? Maybe you lack focus. Maybe you think. You want to make yourself feel better, so you do 85 different things all at once. You have, mm. Oftentimes, I would see this in fitness where a new client would hire me. This is someone who doesn't eat right, doesn't sleep good, doesn't work out, and they come to me like, I want to hire you. I want to work out six days a week. I want a meal plan so I can eat perfectly every single day. I want to do like 15 different things. It never works because it's not sustainable. Focus on one thing, do it really, really well until it becomes a habit. Then you can move on to the next. Or one. It's a much you better strategy. Convince that client uh, to listen to you, right? And everything is going really well, and we've reduced a lot of the activities and a lot of the things that they used to be a part of. But you know, inevitably, like the results aren't enough. Like it, it just seems like they're drawn back into like bringing in some more of those chaotic components. And and I've I've found a lot of battles between clients where it's like, okay, but I also want to do Pilates, and I also want to yeah. go to this yoga class, and I also want to go running on the weekend, and I want to do this and. And, and like, look, everything is working right now. Like, let's not mess this up. And, you know, and this is something I've found myself guilty of doing as well. Like when things are going so well, uh, but we also are just like drawn to like adding these chaotic components back this in. This is a common one in business, by the way, where you have a business and it starts to succeed and you have one thing that you do good. And so then you end up wanting to do 25 different things yeah. <laughs> instead of that one thing. It's a big problem. I think Matt, Mark Randolph, in fact, he touched on it in uh, in our recent interview with him. Yeah, you got you have to trust the process, and this reminds me too of the the quote. You know, how you do anything is how you do everything, and it reminds me of people that can't stick to one thing very long. They're always wanting to try something new, and and lack that ability to just follow through on something and just trust the entire process. They're always trying to add more or do more. Very tough to measure what is what are you doing that has success, and when you're constantly throwing the whole kitchen sink at it, and so. Many times with clients, I'd have to have this conversation of, okay, listen, this is all we're focusing on. I know you want to do this. You want to do that. You want to do those things. Let's first, let's hit this out the park. Let's be consistent with it. Then we'll build upon this. So mm -hmm. a lot of times the people that are not feeling well, it's because it's just, you're throwing too much at the body at one time and you're not focusing on one or two things that will really move the needle. Yes. Now here's the last one. And I feel like this one is a big one uh, these days. And that's that you probably need to lighten up a little bit. Um, yeah. Humor laughter, they probably exist in humans. And the reason why we laugh audibly probably exists in humans precisely to break tension and relieve stress mm -hmm. and to let others or people around you feel that break in tension and that break in stress. I can think of many situations that I've been in that were very stressful and very terrible. And what allowed me to kind of get through it was a little bit of humor, yes, that little bit of laughter. And now it doesn't change the situation, but it definitely changes how I feel for a second and it makes a big difference. It's funny because like, you know, you guys know on my Instagram, I've been reported a few times on, on my memes because people get offended or whatever. And this is just, this wouldn't have happened 20 years ago. Like people would have either liked it or just not watched. But nowadays people seem to be not just easily offended, but ready to be offended. What can I possibly be offended by? And it's because they're just not, they need to lighten up a little bit. Like, okay, it's okay. Like, don't take things so damn seriously. All because serious is good when you want to be focused and, and accomplish certain things. But being serious all the time—that's stressful. Yeah. That doesn't feel good. You need to lighten up and and relax about things sometimes. You know. 
Yeah, this has been one of those um, go-tos for me when I'm in a really challenging situation. I mean, even physically challenging where uh, I've I've been under the, the most extreme stress or, or like football camp or something where uh, I just I, I feel overwhelmed and, and and I have to I have to really just turn that mindset and have fun, have fun with it and and, and work my way through it. And it helps so much. The, the mentality of that will carry you so much further. And like there's there's studies right with the POWs of yeah. how they've been able to uh, get through like insanely grueling situations where they pretty much if if their mentality uh, was was basically like any different uh, they would have died a long time ago but just because that they were stayed positive and then they kept their mind in that direction they were able to make it through part of what comes to mind for me when I think of lighten up or have joy or laughter is also learn to be present because part of what causes us to be tense and have anxiety. Oh, yeah. You're stuck in the future of the That's past, right. aren't you? Exactly. You're constantly in the future or you're constantly in the past. You're constantly thinking about all the bad things that have happened to you or you're constantly stressing about what may come mm -hmm. versus literally being in the moment, being happy with the, the, the breath that you have right now, the day that you have, the freedom that you have, and like being content and happy with your current situation. It doesn't mean you can't have goals that you're pursuing. It doesn't mean you don't have things that you aspire to be or whatever. You can still do that, but also make sure you take those moments to become present in where, where you're currently at today. And I, that's what comes to mind when I think of lighting up. Somebody who is tensed mm. up, stressed, angry, frustrated, not feeling well, all those things going on, many times they're not in the moment. They're, mm -hmm. they're, they're worried about what's to come or they're still hurting from what happened you, in the you, past. Yeah, I can't help but think of the example you brought up with you know people trying to change the world and like so serious and so intense about that. But that same intensity towards acknowledging like uh, you know all all the good things that are going on in their yes. life and around them, and to have these affirmations and and be like frequently addressing that and bringing that up. Their mentality, I, I just I, it would it would go it would do wonders for that individual, and, and it would actually then spawn off to more positive things around them. Yeah, you know you know studies show that laughter um, and joking and fun uh, speeds up healing. You know that they actually they'll do this in hospitals oftentimes. Well, they'll bring in yeah. people to to have entertainment or to make jokes, especially in children's hospitals. Why? Because it shows uh, studies show that it speeds up the recovery process. Like this is a very important part of health. And if you find yourself taking everything so damn seriously all the time, that might just be why you're not feeling so good. You know, lighten up a little bit and have some fun. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com. Check out our free stuff. We've got lots of free stuff for our viewers uh, that are exclusive just for you. Again, it's mindpumpfree.com. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So you can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. Well, what's necessarily wrong with more money? Isn't money okay? Like if someone gave me $10,000, that would be a good thing. Like explain the difference between money connected to goods and services and money just not connected to anything, just more of it existing, but not connected to those goods and services.